given that uh, so the session is being recorded just for everyone to know uh, given that we we have started a couple of years ago giving these uh, teaching awards and in particular these teaching and innovation awards we thought it was a good idea not only to for the jury and for ourselves to recognize it but, it, but it, we think it's a good idea for everybody to to see the cool things you are all working on uh, both you know the winners the runners ups but also some some of the participants in in previous years so it's great to see you around too uh, and the way we're going to proceed, we have one hour, so we're going to have the three uh, the three winners of this year's Teaching and Innovation Awards. We're going to start with El Elias uh, Papa Noyu from the Wheeler Institute, who will who was the actual the the actual winner of the of the award, and then we will have Andres Maroto uh, and David Stolin, who were runners up. So they are going to do like 10, 15 minute presentations. Uh, and after each presentation, you know, we'll be happy to to have some questions, doubts, comments, etc. You will see that some of the things prepared are pretty interactive. So in particular, there's going to be a escape room. We're also going to talk about comedians, and we're also going to start talking about Africa and African history. So it should be a very interesting session for everyone. Uh, Elias, if you want to start, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pedro. Uh, thanks also for the European Economic Association for, recognizes, uh, for recognizing this teamwork uh, that was done by London Business School, Willard Institute for Business and Development. So let me uh, uh, share uh, uh, the screen. And let me just say how this idea came uh, uh, came about. So together with my uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, Stelios Michalopoulos from Brown University, Nathan Nunn uh, from Harvard University at the time, currently at the University of British Columbia, uh, and Leonard Wanshenkon uh, from Princeton University uh, and also affiliated with, uh, uh, with the African School of Economics. Uh, we thought uh, that the research community, uh, and not only in economics, but more generally in social sciences, would be keen to know how economists have approached uh, history, zooming in the case of Africa, where to start with, there was not that much economics research, not to say economic history research say, for many decades, this was also the area that Nathan, Leonard, Stelios, and I had contributed uh, relatively the most. So we thought that the pandemic offers an opportunity uh, to go and try to reach uh, to the research community, but also more generally to other interested parties, uh, and try to communicate how economists approach issues that have long uh, uh, puzzled uh, historians, social scientists, a, a, a cultural anthropologists, scholars working in other uh, disciplines. So uh, what initially we thought, let's try to come up with a course targeting more PhD students in economics. We have been seeing more and more demand for economic history and in particular economic history looking into Africa. But as we were having discussions with Leonard Stelios uh, and Nathan, we came to realize that, look, why target only PhD students in economics? Why not try to reach out also to doctoral students in other social sciences? And as our discussions were evolving, we thought that, look, more and more people are keen uh, to know and understand history. As we see nowadays in other settings, for example, in Ukraine, in Russia, not to say in Gaza and Israel, history seems in many instances to be extremely influential uh, in shaping ongoing developments uh, in politics, but also in economics. So we decided to expand our reach and we took at some, uh, we were discussing very late at night, London time, uh, which was morning in the United States. Uh, and we thought, okay, let's try to reach out to the general public, to interested parties, and let's try to uh, to, to, to popularize this research uh, uh, that has been produced in economics. And Nathan Mann and Leonard and Stelios also posed, you know, let's not have this as solely as um, a course in economics. Uh, let's try to bring also guests 
to learn from their work. And let's try also to bring guests, not only uh, scholars and colleagues in economics, but also in other related issues. So the one thing led to another, and I think in the end, we managed to, uh, uh, to, uh, to bring together in this online uh, open access course, uh, about 58, about 60 scholars, again, across uh, uh, disciplines. Of course, most of them were economists, but many uh, were coming from history and from cultural anthropology, even from linguistics. Uh, in some cases, uh, with the help of the Willard Institute uh, for Business and Development, we had a fantastic team to organize uh, this thing, because as you can imagine, you know, bringing up such a big group of people was far from easy. Everything had to be extremely punctual uh, on time. So at some point in early January, uh, one and uh, almost two years ago, uh, we started advertising. Uh, at the time, uh, we thought that it would be a huge success if we managed to bring uh, around 300, perhaps 400 people. Uh, at some point, uh, I think Nathan said, oh, if we had 500, it's going to be amazing. And then uh, uh, Tiago Martino, the amazing executive director of the Wheeler Institute, um, and also uh, uh, our amazing staff, were keep sending us email. Oh, the first day we have 3,000 people registered. And the second day we have went to 7,000. And we're starting receiving emails. So look, this is super interesting. We want to join in. So we saw a lot of interest uh, also uh, from the continent, uh, which uh, frankly uh, uh, was a very pleasant uh, surprise. Then there were like many uh, uh, technical aspects that the amazing team of the Willis managed to resolve. Uh, then we decided to also invite some uh, friends uh, and colleagues for some plenary talks. Uh, let me just mention them. Uh, Joe Henry discussed his amazing work on weird culture and how this relates to Africa. Celestine Monga shared his insight doing policy making and advising governments in Africa. Mo Ibrahim, uh, who used to be one of the governors of the London Business School, discussed the work of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation promoting better uh, and sound governance. Jim Robinson uh, and Chaim uh, Neo uh, also discussed their ongoing work zooming in Nigeria, how particular cultural traits of Africa can serve as the backbone for the progress uh, of the continent. Now, uh, we had, so here I'm just giving you some statistics of the huge participation that we received. In a nutshell, about 27,000 people registered uh, for the course. Uh, we did an introductory video uh, with the four of us that was watched by more than a quarter million people across the world. What we feel extremely proud is that the majority of participants were from Africa. Uh, overall, they were coming from 160 uh, or so countries. And what we are particularly passionate at the London Business School and the Wheeler Institute is to bring together scholars and practitioners with an interest, let's say, in economics, with those that have an interest, let's say, in management, those that have an interest in finance, in policy science, in cultural anthropology. So we're really pleased that the background of, uh, of our audience had actually a very diverse background. And I mean here both in terms of geography, but also in terms uh, of education. Uh, now, the way the course was structured, and here you can see some of the, of the highlights uh, and some of the very pleasant comments uh, that we received uh, from the participants. The way the, the course was structured was as follows. So uh, we structured, the, so every week we had two uh, sessions. And in some weeks, we had the third one, which was the plenary. The sessions were delivered uh, by Nathan, uh, Nan, Stegos, Michalopoulos, Nordon, one second, or me. But in each session, which was one hour and 15 minutes, it was split into two subparts. And we would always invite at least one, typically two or three guests, some from history, some from economics, who were conveying their very exciting research. In the end, in the last 15 to 20 minutes, we had discussion. Uh, I still remember that in the first session, we had something like 800 questions posted on Zoom that we had uh, to answer. We invited students from the London Business School and alumni, doctoral students from Harvard, from Princeton, from the African School of Economics to moderate those discussions. And the moderators would collect questions and they would pose them to our speakers. And then we had an amazing team of doctoral students, many of them from Africa, who would actually take 
the most uh, common, if you like, the frequently asked questions. And then by Friday, we would send a very detailed email to the participants with further readings, uh, suggestions for additional uh, kind of, uh, of research. And also uh, the PhD students would have sessions with those who were mostly interested uh, and they will discuss more technical aspects of the research that we that we prepare. And to our surprise, you had about 3,000 people uh, regularly joining in every Friday in those uh, sessions, we call them recitations, that the PhD students uh, would organize. Um, so this was, uh, in a nutshell, uh, our initiative uh, at the Wheeler Institute uh, uh, for Business and Development. Uh, let me again say that we're truly thankful to the European Economic Association for recognizing uh, this work uh, with this prize that to us it's very important, typically academic economists care about the research related kind of prizes, uh, we take a big pride in trying to convey the messages from research into the wider community, this is what we strive at the London Business School and more generally as Elias, Stelios, Nathan uh, and Leonard. Uh, we are also currently thinking of a new vintage discourse moving now from history to more contemporary issues related to political economy. And we hope that uh, in the following months through the Willen Institute uh, uh, platform, we will be able to build uh, on this research and this teaching initiative and continue this open access kind of framework. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. And again, thank you so much uh, for recognizing our work with this uh, award. Thank you. So oh, thanks a lot, Elias. Uh, congratulations on the prize, but also congratulations on the on the numbers, right? It's really impressive that one of these things really gets uh, so much attendance. I, I was actually wondering while you were presenting, uh, given those numbers, uh, whether there was going to be some continuity to this. And this is pretty much what you just announced, right? Uh, it seems like there is a real thirst to, to learn about a you know, a continent uh, in terms of economics that we don't know that much about. And, and it seems like, uh, you know, you should take the baton here. So so can you tell us a little bit more about how, how you're going to give continuity to this? Yes. So thanks for your question, uh, uh, Pedro. So let me just say that this work would have never happened had there not been an extremely dedicated team, uh, let me call it on the back office, at the Wheeler Institute for Business and Development, running 23 sessions at exactly the same time when we had many participants that we had to help joining from many African countries with bad connectivity, for example. And Nathan Nunn at the time was uh, at the University of British Columbia, so there were like many time differences. Uh, the research assistants and the teaching assistants, some of them, uh, uh, so Alfred Tembo was in Zambia. Uh, Ibrahim uh, was in Sierra Leone. It was uh, pretty challenging on the, on the, on the technical uh, aspect, not to say uh, doing the presentation, inviting the guests. So we we're like uh, super tired after that, although it was a very big uh, pleasure to receive the very positive feedback from the participants. So we are considering right now with Nathan, uh, with Stelios Michalopoulos, with uh, Leonard one second and Nathan Nunn to do a second vintage. Now look on contemporary issues related to political economy. Uh, and we are thinking of doing this in uh, sometime early uh, 2024. Uh, uh, Tiago Martino, the executive director of the Wheeler Institute and uh, our team is receiving a lot of emails uh, from participants, mainly from the continent. So we are extremely happy uh, to see this interest and we feel that the least we can do uh, is continue on this initiative. And on that, let me just say also that the uh, European Economic Association Award was a significant boost <laughs> uh, to us and the team uh, to keep working and provide uh, this uh, service uh, to the wider community. Uh, because we all uh, believe uh, that economics should try to do the most it can uh, in order to convey uh, uh, how economic research can help society think about the past, reflect on ongoing uh, uh, discussions, not only related to economics, but more generally about uh, social issues. Very good. Thanks a lot. So, yeah, sorry, oh, Pedro. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you if you allow me just to jump in and complement a couple of things that Ilya has mentioned, I think also important to say that during the course, uh, participation was important for us. So, if, as Ilya has said, we 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 recognize the importance of organizing additional sessions, just to 
make sure that all of you know such a big crowd they had opportunity to be part of it and to ask their questions and to discuss their opinions so that was important but then also we saw an opportunity to organize a number of questionnaires research related questionnaires during the the lecture series and for us to sense check some of the the research topics that um, the team is is working on so there was thousands of data points collected um, as well through the course. Um, and then finally, there was also an element of, um, we thought that we should award somehow those that were regular part of the series and they were attending um, all of the sessions or most of the sessions. So we did run assessments and making sure that the, the participants, they could actually um, be uh, eligible to have a, a letter participation. In order to get the letters participation, they would need to show participation. So that was important for us in terms of engagement also to uh, an incentive for people to continue to engage and to join the sessions. Um, but more broadly also to, to say thank you for, for all of the time that they put into it and the contribution. So in the end, we awarded more than 400 letters of participation for highly engage um, audience members. And, and then finally, just um, as um, with all of this new community and new contacts we have, we've been able to create some research communities in specific countries in Africa. So really is, is leading a number of projects on that front. And um, for example, only in Nigeria, we have now more than a thousand people, part of the res research community, and they are collaborating with us on other research projects we are doing in the region. And many of them, they came from the registrations of this course. So um, at the Will Institute, we're just looking for other ways to engage with that new community of people we have. Um, and of course, the, the upcoming edition of the course will help, but we are looking at many other initiatives as well. That's great, thank you. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Thank you for joining the, this morning. Uh, any other comments about uh, this first presentation or questions or anything? No, we're fine. Okay, so thank you very much. So we're gonna move on with, to the second presentation by Andres Maroto from Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, who's one of the runners up for his uh, project using uh, escape rooms to teach uh, economics. Uh, I'm going to share on the chat a link to the presentation Andres is doing because it's actually going to be active. And Andres is also gonna put it here. So Andres, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Pedro. Thank you, the association, for for this uh, for this runner up. Thank you for the education committee for for liking my, my project. And I try try to 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 sum up or or describe it in in a few minutes. But uh, it's not easy to 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 do it. But but I I try. Um, the project, uh, the project is about uh, teaching economic theory using uh, digital educational escape rooms, uh, DIRS, and um, the the impacts uh, we relate uh, are related uh, with the motivation and engagement, but uh, primarily to to learning uh, outcomes and and other uh, complementary goals. Uh, I I have the program it or, or prepared it. Uh, a little kind of uh, escape room, or more specifically, uh, a digital breakout for this presentation. So uh, uh, you you can play or you can uh, interact uh, with the with the presentation as as, as you want. Uh, there are some links and uh, and some uh, uh, other uh, things uh, across the the presentation. So I I hope uh, you you like it. Well, the, the main uh, the main aim of the of the project is uh, to describe uh, an applied experience of uh, using this kind of uh, escape rooms of uh, digital uh, educational uh, escape rooms. Uh, firstly, as a motivational review tool uh, for economic theory courses, uh, and then uh, outline some of the likely implementations or future uh, action of of these uh, uh, gamification activities. Uh, this project is uh, the first time uh, in evaluation uh, impacts in, in economics and business in higher education, at least at, uh, at evaluating uh, learning outcomes and complementing them with uh, engagement and motivation or teamwork skills. 
Well, uh, here is uh, started uh, the, the little escape room. Uh, I first uh, describe uh, why or the motivation of the of the project. Uh, this proposal is funds uh, on early research, uh, uh, exactly uh, on two two papers uh, uh, in 2021 and recently in 2023. Uh, you can you can read them in the in the QE codes in the in the slide, or or you can only uh, uh, tap on the, the the QR and you are directly uh, redirected to to these uh, to these papers. One of the the main concerns and uh, among teachers in, in higher education, uh, especially those teaching abstract or, or theoretical courses is to engage and increase the, the motivation of, uh, of our students during our classes, our, our sessions. Uh, in particular, there are many, many teachers uh, on, uh, on economic theory that, that think that uh, it's very difficult to, to gamificate or to, to play uh, with, with some activities uh, to teach uh, effectively uh, uh, the contents of the, of the economic uh, theoretical courses. But uh, uh, there are some literature that uh, is in contrast of these uh, opinions. Uh, it's more difficult in, uh, even in, in online environments and, uh, or uh, for online and blended learning that, like the projects uh, like uh, the Wheeler Institute uh, have shown uh, recently. And there are some other uh, papers that show that uh, uh, the there are uh, positive uh, spillovers of digital tools after the COVID uh, pandemic. The, the digital escape rooms, the digital educational escape rooms combines uh, two, two lines or two approaches used to, to raise engagement. Uh, for one side, uh, the game-based uh, learning or the gamification, and uh, for the other side, the, the use of digital environments. Uh, there are uh, positive effects of, of both of them. Uh, of of gamification and and also of the of the use of uh, of virtual or digital uh, environments on education. Uh, additionally, the, the, there has been an, an expansion of educational use of this kind of uh, activities in the in the recent times. Uh, and literature uh, outlined the, that there is important also the the design of the game and that the game. Uh, uh, will be aligned uh, with the objectives and the, the evaluation uh, criteria of the of the course. Finally, uh, as previously mentioned, uh, digital environments uh, can solve uh, most challenges of uh, the the physical uh, educational escape room, like uh, time constraints, uh, scale of economies, uh, some logistic issues. Uh, the way uh, teachers uh, instruct uh, the students, and also there are uh, a wide range of digital platforms uh, providing uh, a lot of uh, various uh, templates and examples of uh, this kind of uh, of activities. Uh, the digital use of this uh, educational escape room is easier uh, to use, more flexible and more uh, versatile. Uh, also, uh, they they provide a live interaction and, and the advantages of this interaction uh, is easily uh, generalized to, to any fields or any, any sphere of the, of the education from uh, primary to higher education, uh, from uh, social science to, to, to physical or, or, science or medical science. Uh, but uh, uh, although there are a, a lot of uh, papers that show these this advantages of this kind of uh, gamification, uh, there are a few experiences uh, evaluated in higher education, and only one of, uh, of each 10 uh, papers of, of each 10 experience is uh, based on digital uh, environments. So this is the, the evaluated or the originality of, the, of this project. The context and sample selection uh, uh, was uh, extracted uh, from a student's role in, in industrial organization uh, course, uh, uh, market theory, uh, uh, enrolled in, in economics degree uh, from uh, 2019 uh, to 2022. 
uh, so the, there are three different uh, uh, courses uh, in the sample. Uh, we use a random assignment uh, to experimental groups or control groups, and uh, we control them uh, by gender and by previous uh, average mark on similar uh, uh, courses on economic theory. Uh, here you can you can see the the, the timeline of the design of the experiment. Uh, there were uh, used two uh, different uh, randomized uh, control trials uh, with a pre and a post uh, test, and data combines uh, both qualitative and uh, quantitative instruments. Uh, the idea was to evaluate both uh, impacts of the of the escape room in uh, learning outcomes. Uh, and the, the motivation of, of the students. The experience was carried out at the end of the academic year uh, because uh, the, the first aim is what to evaluate the role of the, of the year as a, as a reviewing tool uh, during two sessions, uh, two hours for the game, uh, divided in uh, four or five uh, people teams, and another one hour uh, for a discussion or debriefing the, the activity. The experimental group uh, uh, were uh, of uh, 17th each year, uh, about 30, 40 students each uh, respectively each year. And as uh, I previously uh, commented, uh, there were a combination of uh, quantitative and qualitative instruments. Uh, some uh, uh, questionnaires or online service for, for the quantitative analysis and some uh, open questions of the service and the focus group for, for the qualitative. Uh, there, uh, um, in terms of the, of the design of the, of the escape room, uh, it was designed with uh, different but dependent uh, stages uh, as uh, escape uh, boxes uh, with a linear flow. Well, and now I'll present some of the previous results. Uh, first of all, uh, digital escape room uh, uh, has a result uh, as a useful reviewing tool for learning. Uh, you can see in this uh, in this uh, graph uh, that the, the students uh, who, who play the activity in the experimental group uh, show uh, higher uh, marks than the, than the other students uh, who didn't play. And this uh, this improvement of the of the marks of the of the students enrolled in the activity uh, is uh, even higher uh, year after year when uh, we can uh, uh, improve the the design of the activity and limit some of the detected uh, issues or or fails in the, in the previous uh, years. Uh, second one, uh, there, uh, there is another uh, motivational effect uh, of uh, these activities. Uh, we can see a similar uh, increment of the, of the motivation of the student uh, uh, engaged in, in the teams who, who play the, the digital escape room. Uh, and this uh, uh, improvement is uh, also shown in, in the three years in the, in the sample. And finally, uh, the global perception of the of the experience uh, was uh, very very high, very very well uh, perceived by the by the students. And it's important to to highlight or to to outline that the 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 perception or the good uh, evaluation of the of the year uh, by the students is not related to to the to the fact that they uh, previously. Uh, play these uh, kind of activities, uh, or even if they are uh, used to to use uh, some uh, interactive uh, uh, activities or other uh, interactive uh, uh, issues uh, around the course, uh, because the, the evaluation of the year is even uh, higher in than the the rest of activities of the of the course. Finally, some, uh, some, uh, some of the, the final remarks uh, of the project. Uh, uh, as I previously mentioned, this is the, the first time of uh, using digital educational escape rooms in economics and business in higher education. And um, the results conclude that the experience uh, increased indigenous uh, motivation, 
it uh, helps to useful review queues contents and this is the the main value added of the of the project the students who who play this kind of the activities uh, uh, present uh, better marks at the end of the of the course than than the other uh, students uh, additionally the this kind of activity strengths other uh, transversal and labor skills uh, uh, helpful for the for the future of the of the students and finally this kind of uh, activities can be easily generalized to other uh, courses uh, subjects or even uh, other uh, levels of, of education uh, and know what uh, some other likely implementations that we are uh, or even uh, starting to to project or or we are thinking to to implement in the future uh, for example uh, it will be interesting to to evaluate the effects on digital skills of uh, of the, our students because uh, obviously this is a, a digital environment so uh, it is uh, an effect a positive effect on, on this kind of of uh, competencies uh, it can be uh, important to analyze also uh, the impact uh, on collaborative or teamwork skills because uh, it's an activity that uh, students uh, uh, play uh, in teams of uh, four or five uh, people and we can uh, compare it uh, to other uh, collaborative uh, activities uh, during the courses. Uh, it's interesting to we even uh, analyze uh, gender issues uh, as uh, generally uh, women uh, play differently than uh, that, uh, men do. And finally, uh, uh, we can also work in on different uh, learning styles and uh, evaluate if uh, the different learning styles affect uh, the way uh, students uh, play or the way uh, students uh, obtain some uh, uh, learning outcomes or others. That's uh, uh, done the, the the presentation uh, or the the little breakout uh, is uh, is ended. And uh, thank you very much uh, again for for the for your attention. Uh, thank you uh, the Education Committee and the, the European Economic Association for the for this prize. Uh, I'm very happy to. To, to this kind of activities like uh, uh, in this uh, kind of, uh, of audiences. So uh, I'm very, very honored to, to be here uh, sharing my work with, with some uh, huge uh, colleagues and, and associations. Uh, if you want uh, to, to know more about this kind of activities, I, I have linked uh, a, a little uh, sample of this kind of uh, Escape room. Uh, if you want to play or you want to to introduce in these activities, it's a a, a little digital educational escape room for a market theory introductory course of uh, the first uh, degree of uh, economics, and uh, it's a AC AC gain of uh, five uh, levels, different uh, different levels. Uh, you can uh, play or you can. Uh, introduce and then if, uh, if you want thank you very much again and if you want any question or any doubt uh, i will pleasure to to answer it thanks a lot andres uh, just to clarify this uh, this last thing pressure hand video that you are showing is that in the same link that you provide yeah. it's, yeah. it's the same link okay so it's yeah. at the end of if the you, presentation yeah if you tap of the of the button of more in the in the last uh, slide you can uh, go to the to the map that's great. That's super useful. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I have one question, which was, uh, you know, the way you presented this, it seemed pretty much, you know, it was your teaching innovation project, but at the same time, it seems like it's well designed to to evaluate how it works and to actually do research, right? So this is a combination of, I guess, your own research and your teaching activities, right? So this is a nice way to show that both things can be combined, right? Uh, so, so is your intention to to publish this as a as a research paper in, in and in which kind of journals uh, does this kind of research fit? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, 
this this is not my my main uh, research uh, line. Uh, I usually work on uh, efficiency and productivity uh, analysis. Uh, but uh, in the in the recent years, uh, we have created here in the in the Autonoma of Madrid uh, um, a community of uh, of teachers that uh, that uh, are uh, engaged with this kind of uh, innovation uh, teaching. Uh, improvements and uh, we have created a, a, a course of um, a specialization course of uh, of mentoring uh, mm -hmm. to, to help other other teachers and other colleagues and this uh, uh, pushed me uh, to to combine the the educational uh, sphere of the of the research in my in my curricula uh, in especially or, or particularly the, this uh, this aspect of the of the educational escape rooms is the main uh, uh, activity uh, I have I have worked in the in the recent years and and I have uh, previously uh, published uh, two papers uh, the the both are uh, linked in the in the presentation in the yes. in the QR codes one in Spanish uh, uh, who which uh, which was related to to the first uh, stages of the of the experience. That was the the step uh, or the 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 pass uh, from the physical environments uh, previously to the to the COVID uh, pandemic uh, to digital uh, environments. And the second one, uh, which uh, explained the the results on the effects of the learning outcomes and motivation is recently uh, published on of the International Journal of Educational Management. There, there are some and other uh, uh, papers in the future, one of the of the teamwork uh, skills and another of the of the gender gap. Uh, and I hope that there, there will be published uh, as soon as possible. Perfect. That's great. Thank you very much. Any other intervention, any comments, questions from Andres? Yeah, Andres, is there any limit on how many students can be doing this at the same time? Uh, one of the advantages of the use of the digital environments uh, is that uh, there is no limit. Uh, uh, we have uh, we have run uh, some uh, some escape rooms with uh, two hundred uh, students in the in the pandemic in the COVID time in the in the years uh, with uh, with COVID, because uh, we run the same activity for for various uh, for various uh, courses or for various uh, classes uh, at the same time, and and another example of uh, of activities uh, have run only for for forty or fifty students uh, uh, at a live uh, uh, classroom. Uh, at, uh, so there is no limit uh, at the at the beginning of uh, it's one of the advantages of the use of uh, digital environments. And did you find that people knew what escape rooms were, and or did you have to sort of explain the concept? Well, uh, the, I I try to to briefly explain the, all the activities they 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 run uh, around the course and also uh, this uh, kind of uh, escape room. But uh, there is no there is no obligation uh, for for the students to to have a previous experience on this kind of uh, activities. Uh, one of the questions of the of the final survey of the of the activity uh, specifically ask uh, them uh, uh, for this, and and it's uh, it's interesting that the, the most of them uh, never uh, played uh, that kind of uh, of games. Even uh, in an educational sphere or in a in a in an another uh, uh, luxury as uh, explained. So uh, it's better if you are uh, familiar with this kind of uh, environments, but it's not uh, uh, obligatory. That's great. Do we move on for the last presentation? So our last presenter is David Stalling from the Toulouse Business School who is also a runner-up uh, for this prize. And he's gonna talk about his project on communicating cutting edge economics research through interviews with comedians. So the floor is yours, David, thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you very much uh, to the uh, EA for uh, uh, avoiding this uh, project and for this opportunity to present it. Communicating cutting edge uh, economics research through interviews with comedians, why would we do such a thing? And there are many reasons. And uh, the most important ones for me are, well, we want to get more people excited about economics. Um, and by the way, uh, when I say more people, uh, including attracting diverse populations to economics academia, those who are from educationally underprivileged backgrounds, you know, if we can use humor to um, uh, engage them with economics, that's, that's great. Uh, secondly, comedians are great translators uh, of any uh, concepts, complex concepts for the general public. Humor is synergistic with learning. That's a very important point. There is a prominent evolutionary theory of humor that says actually the reason we experience uh, mirth, joy, the, the reason we get all these um, uh, cocktails of uh, neurochemicals that give us pleasure or serotonin and so on, when we laugh, when we get a joke, is because that's uh, an evolutionary incentive for us to learn about uh, the world around us. So we are basically bringing humor back to uh, where it belongs to help us learn. And uh, it's a laboratory actually for illuminating complex ideas through humor. Every time we, um, we do another uh, interview, we learn something about how we can communicate better um, about economics and about science more generally. And of course, this is a, a teaching award. And why am I talking about research? Well, uh, I, I feel it's very important for us to communicate that um, economics is not a dead science, that there's exciting stuff that's happening now, and to get um, students and economic students and the broader public interested in uh, current economic research. So uh, an overview of the project, uh, what, what's this about? Uh, Comedian-led interviews with prominent scholars about their recent work. These uh, interviews could be online, um, they could be recorded in a studio. Uh, they could be on location. Uh, they could be even with a live audience. And I'll mention examples of each of those. And humor is used to, um, just at the very uh, broad level, illuminate the subject matter and make it appealing even to non-specialist audiences. And uh, in the case of research, basically any audience is going to be a uh, non-specialist with the exception of the um, small number of people who are um, in that field. And uh, these interviews can be uh, unscripted. That's our Explain It to a Comedian series. Uh, or they can be scripted, and that's our If Researchers Could Speak series. By the way, you have a link to the YouTube channel where all these interviews um, can be seen. Um, and um, so uh, the, the unscripted ones... Um, are just traditional interviews, uh, except that the interviewer is a comedian, so they find opportunities um, for humor to uh, help make the subject matter more engaging. And scripted ones are essentially sketches where the um, in the the, uh, the comedian who's the interviewer is playing the role of um, um, the comedian is playing the role of the uh, interviewer, and uh, and basically each of them they say something that gets to the heart of the matter, but also tends to leave the interviewee um, uh, speechless, um, and that's why we call it the researchers could speak. Um, um, so, who are the researchers so far? They come from uh, all over the research space: um, Georgia State, Stanford, Harvard, Purdue, uh, University of Colorado. Uh, yes, Nobel laureate Ben Holmes from, from MIT uh, also has been interviewed um, by our comedians, uh, Imperial College, Ohio State, and so on and so forth. Um, who are the comedians so far? Um, one is uh, Samuel Bade. Uh, if his face looks familiar to some of you, it's because uh, he has been um, host of a hit Netflix series called 100 Humans. And he actually has a uh, uh, quite strong background. Um, he has a uh, uh, cum laude bachelor's in business and applied maths uh, from UC Berkeley. Um, the second comedian is Daya Lakshminarayanan. Uh, she also has uh, economics uh, related bachelor's and master's degrees from 
um, MIT. She's a uh, she's a uh, stand-up comedian, TV host, and storyteller. Uh, I've been working with them for uh, years. Um, we need more uh, comedians. Uh, suggestions are welcome. With unscripted interviews, uh, what happens is that uh, generally I suggest several questions. So I read the research paper. I suggest several uh, questions that the interviewers, the comedians should ask. They also take a look at the paper. With scripted ones, generally I write the uh, script and the comedians then may or may not uh, punch up uh, the script. So punching up is a, a technical comedy term, which means uh, adding more jokes. Sometimes they'll do it on the fly. Yes, they're that good. Um, now, just a little bit on what makes something funny, because it might seem like um, some kind of mysterious thing, but to a large extent, humor is quite algorithmic. And I just want to spend one um, slide on that, which will also help me motivate how humor can illuminate complex topics. And so what makes something funny is if something is unexpected um, and unexpected can be uh, decomposed further into, okay, it's along the direction that you were thinking. So your train of thought was heading in this direction, but uh, the punchline is much uh, much beyond in that direction what what you were thinking um, the statement was going to be, what you were expecting. Or it could be in a direction that you were thinking, but not what you were expected, but much less so. That's understatement. Or it could be, again, um, if you look at the direction of your thought, actually, you end up in the other direction, which is irony. So uh, hyperbole, understatement, irony, these are very common humor tools. But also... Um, unexpected could be uh, kind of orthogonal to a train of thought. So your train of thought is heading this way, but you have something that's quite unexpected, an unexpected analogy or an unexpected illustration, unexpected example. So you're, or, you know, you might be moving from the general to the specific or, or vice versa. So this is something that's really kind of uh, um, uh, out there. It seems like a digression. So um, basically you have this unexpected punchline, but what makes it funny is that it has to somehow make sense. There has to be some kind of connection to the, uh, to the setting, to the, to the setup of this uh, joke or uh, this uh, humorous incident. And it can make sense in a, in a variety of, uh, of ways. It could be just for wordplay, it could just rhyme. Uh, it could be because the analogy or the illustration are clearly related. It could be through reference, reference to a common experience, reference to something that's been said before, which is a callback. It could even make sense through uh, absurdity in the sense that, yes, it's absurd, but it's absurd in this way that life can be absurd. And again, there is this recognition, there is this connection. So it makes something funny as if it's unexpected, yet it somehow makes sense. And then this realization of, of this, uh, that it's unexpected, yet it makes sense by the audience is not too slow, not too fast. So that's the, that's the art of uh, humor, the art of timing as well. And of course, it shouldn't be too upsetting to the audience. Um, so this is the uh, humor um, algorithm. And of course, for the humor to, to illuminate the subject matter, ideally the ha-ha and the aha are linked. So you're getting the joke. And at the same time, that permits you to get insight into the um, uh, subject matter that's, that's being exposed. And so uh, how can humor benefit learning? Uh, firstly, by creating a mood that's uh, uh, conducive to learning. If you, are, if you are happy, if you're enjoying yourself, you're flooded with uh, these uh, positive uh, um, uh, chemicals, um, you're gonna be uh, uh, more open to learning. Humor can also act as a mnemonic device. Oh, remember the joke and then, okay, so this joke actually, yes, now I'm remembering what the subject matter was. Um, it rewards understanding. Again, if the ha-ha and the aha are linked, then you're getting uh, this joyful experience as a reward for, uh, for uh, getting the insight. Um, by giving novel insight into the topic, uh, jokes have, by definition, have to be um, unexpected. So uh, it, some kind of novel insight often results and uh, making the learner want to learn more and, and, and maybe even getting them hooked on learning. Um, maybe they, uh, they didn't realize that, that learning about uh, seemingly complex, seemingly forbidding ideas can be actually um, a lot of fun. So uh, here are some examples. 
Uh, here is one of our interviews about the economics of COVID. Um, it's an online, unscripted interview uh, with uh, Professor Flavia Toxpard at the University of Cambridge. Uh, here, right off the bat, uh, Sammy, our comedian, opens by saying that he deliberately arranged his apartment to look like it did during lockdown. And of course, we uh, all realize that's his flat's normal state, but this already sets uh, a light mood uh, for this potentially heavy topic. Uh, so visual humor, there's a lot of joy and unexpected connections during this unscripted interview, um, uh, callbacks and references, some wordplay. Uh, another example, um, this is an online scripted interview with um, uh, Vika Sagarwal at Georgia State. It's about his paper called Birth Order and Fund Manager Trading Behavior. Um, Daya is the um, interviewer. And uh, this is a scripted uh, interview, so we try to find the humorous angle for the central idea of the paper. And the central idea here is that later born um, uh, investment fund managers behave like stereotypical younger siblings. Uh, in other words, they take greater professional risks, even to the uh, point of being fined more by the regulators. And there's actually, there's, uh, there's quite a bit of research throughout the economics uh, literature about birth order effects and uh, decision making. Um, at the core of this interview is a humorous illustration uh, of this idea where Daya, uh, who is playing this interviewer, makes it all about herself uh, as someone who is still upset about her younger sister stealing her toys when they were little. And it's all good fun, but the core point of the paper stays with you because it's indelibly linked to the, um, uh, to the subject uh, of the research. Um, Eva Welch at uh, UCLA, The Economics of Climate Change. So this was recorded in a studio. It's unscripted. Uh, great back and forth here between uh, Daya and Evo. Uh, you just have to watch it. Uh, Evo has a fantastic sense of humor to begin with. And by this time, he had spent uh, a lot of time working with comedians and recording humorous educational sketches for us. And in this interview, he's just uh, on fire. Uh, taking things to uh, another level, uh, a live audience, um, unscripted. Um, uh, this is Bengt Holmstrom, Nobel Prize laureate, ben, uh, Bengt Holmstrom talking about uh, the theory of incentives and his uh, um, other work. Um, this is from a live show we did two months ago at the European Finance Association's 50th annual conference. And uh, we'll be releasing uh, this content in the coming months. So uh, subscribe to our channel, which is there on the um, right. The link is on the right of the slide. So uh, how does one do this? Um, for uh, for uh, unscripted interviews, I, I mentioned that you uh, uh, prepare some, some questions, some angles in advance. And of course you have uh, brilliant comedians who also have um, uh, quantitative backgrounds uh, who, uh, who conduct this. Um, but I would say that uh, really uh, for, any, um, for any topic, however complex, um, we can do a funny but insightful scripted interview. Um, and um, we've done this many times. Uh, we've taken some on as challenges because people would say, oh, you know, you can't make this uh, fun. And, and we have, so here's a case study. Uh, so this is a, a recent paper that I, uh, um, I believe, and many people agree with me, uh, it's a very important paper, and I believe it deserves to be widely known. It's called Non-Standard Errors. Um, but the, uh, the abstract is, is pretty dry, as, as, as it should be. So in statistics, samples are drawn from a population in a data-generating process. Uh, standard errors measure the uncertainty and estimates of population parameters. In science, evidence is generated to test hypotheses in an evidence-generating process, EGP. We claim that EGP variation across researchers adds uncertainty, non-standard errors. And then it talks about the uh, empirical study, crowd, uh, kind of crowdsourced empirical study with 164 um, research teams uh, who, who uh, study the same issue. And, um, and then the paper analyzes dispersion and the results, the non-standard error. Now, um, and by the way, this was presented by the um, uh, sort of lead author, uh, Albert Menkfeld uh, at the last EEA conference in Barcelona. So how do we turn this into a funny, insightful, scripted interview? Um, 
so uh, lessons for uh, ideas for creating a sketch, and I realize I'm uh, running short on time, so I'll try to wrap up quickly. Um, you think of a, um, a comic uh, character with two, three exaggerated traits. You make your co uh, comic character want something. You have your comic character take increasingly radical steps uh, to get what they uh, want. Um, they get or what they want or not, and then you throw in a final twist. So this is kind of you know classic, um, uh, classic steps for this. And so we have our, um, uh, sorry, uh, we have um, the sketch. You can watch it um, uh, with Albert Mangfeld, the lead author of this um, uh, of this paper. And uh, I'm not gonna, uh, and, and it's, it's interesting to kind of watch it and kind of deconstruct it in terms of where does the humor come from? Where is the learning and how are they connected? So I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna deconstruct it for you. I'll just say that uh, what the character, what, what the character played by Samuel Bade really wants is to come to Amsterdam. And uh, so we filmed the sequel recently called non Standard Errors 2, bigger and even less standard. And it's an on-location scripted um, uh, video. And the world premiere is actually going to be an international film festival uh, in The Hague in the Netherlands. If you're around, stop by. And I think there's an important lesson in that, that uh, it's about making economics engaging and people become interested in it even if they had no interest in it before. So this is not an economics festival, it's a film festival and people come to be entertained, but they will end up um, with economics uh, insights. And by the way, uh, Albert and I will both be at the festival for Q&A with the audience. So again, uh, outreach. Um, final slide, what you can do. Um, you can watch our, um, um, uh, our videos, our interviews uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, I would encourage you to consider using them as prompts for classroom discussion. Um, it can be done anywhere from undergraduate to PhD courses. Um, reflect on the humor techniques that are used and how you can use them in your own research outreach and teaching. Obviously, if you subscribe to the channel and share this with uh, others, uh, that would be great. And that would be very helpful. And if you know of more comedians to collaborate with, uh, if you have ideas for growing, promoting, funding this project, uh, write to me. And thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to present and, um, and for the award. Thanks a lot, David. Yeah, uh, it, it's great. I, I put actually the link on the on the uh, on the chat, so if anybody wants to go there directly and subscribe, I was thinking while you were presenting, uh, you know, I'm a an amateur, let's say, an amateur comedian, right? I try to be funny in class, but I, I many times I don't succeed, right? So it's from your experience with these projects. Do you think, you know, perhaps it's a it's a different project altogether? But do you think we could work on trying to make professors more engaging and in particular and using uh, humor in an effective manner in the classroom, right? So so that's something that could come out of, of this project, right? Absolutely. And uh, in fact, what we did at the last uh, European Finance Association um, meeting is we first conducted these uh, interviews in uh, private, we had them privately recorded, and then we put on this talk show where there's a, uh, there's an audience and the uh, comedians interview the researchers. And uh, it was very uh, rewarding to see how just in a matter of days, uh, having first worked with the comedians a little bit um, and then reflecting uh, on it, and then two days later, even one day later, uh, being interviewed live uh, in, uh, in the show, uh, people become funnier, they are much more relaxed, they're much more natural. And I think that's, that's just how it works. You rub shoulders with comedians, you, you, you experience this and you, you just become better through that experience. So that's great. Uh, so I don't know if I, we can announce it, but we will be trying to uh, enlarge this together. So, so there'll be other things related to comedy future, in the future of the European Economic Association, hopefully. Uh, which is the idea of these awards, by the way. So we are trying to create a community of uh, academic professors uh, who we also care about teaching uh, and making teaching innovative. So please reach out uh, to any of us. Let's try to build a community here and whatever you can do to promote even the recording of this session today, but also the activities the community are doing, you know, they will, you will be very, very welcome. If anybody wants to have some final comments to, to end up. Or any questions for David or, or the others? No?
Okay, so I think we're perfectly on time. Uh, David told us that timing is important also, so, so we did very well in, in this aspect. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. Congratulations again for the, the to the winners and the runners up. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we shouldn't have made you work after uh, you know we gave you an award, but that's uh, you know that was the catch up uh, with these prizes. And as uh, Cloda uh, put on on the chat. Uh, we are having this uh, seed uh, corner new projects that you may want. She, she has put it in the chat. So there's a deadline coming out. Actually, it's, I think, at the end of next week. So there's a link there about instructions. If anybody has some projects that you want to present there, we also, apart from the, the teaching awards, we also have the seed corner uh, uh, funds uh, that are available. So please uh, reach out to us and, you know, whatever we can do to improve teaching, uh, we'll try to help you. Thank you very much uh, and see you soon.